Welcome back to Inside Politics. Our guest today, Dr. Shama Schwartz, a presidential scholar from Vanderbilt University, also a professor of history and political science. We were talking about this emergency um, declaration. It's possible that Congress could override that, but much like overriding a presidential veto on a spending bill, uh, that's a big task to do. It takes a two-thirds vote, not just of one house, but both houses to override. This would be the real issue. I mean, as long as uh, one of the interesting things that's sort of different from even the past shutdowns uh, is that the Republicans have control of the Senate. And uh, I, this is where uh, both, not only on the this particular legislation, but also on impeachment, you realize that any sort of effort by Congress on this president is going to face real so challenges. So where does the money come from if he decides to declare an emergency, take money from, there's been talk about him taking it out of the emergency money that Congress has already appropriated for disaster relief, particularly all the particular hurricanes in Puerto Rico right. and California, other places like that. That sounds like it's opening up a whole other can of controversy for doing that. So uh, is is that the way to go if he's looking for where to take the money? And $5 billion is not easy to find, even in a big federal government. It, it's not easy to find. I mean, there is there probably is some in the Defense Department budget. There's some in, obviously, this disaster relief. But you're right. As soon as he starts taking money from some disaster relief, you create new political challenges. The government of Puerto Rico has already issued a protest and saying that this would be a disaster, a disaster for them to to lose that funding. But so. if he does this, is to give him a chance to declare victory, walk off stage, and then if the courts overturn it, then he can at least say, well, I tried, I did what I can do, it's those big bad courts that wouldn't let me do this. It gets the whole issue off, off the front burner and I don't think the Democrats would like the outcome of that, but it would at least get things moving forward and the government open and refunded. I think that's probably likely, and I think that's not a, the analogy, of course, again, also with the immigration ban. You know, these major promises that were such a central part of his campaign and then being able to say, I did it, and then have the courts deal with it and then uh, be able either to blame the courts or basically get victory through the courts. Now, as much angst and confusion and controversy there's been about the shutdown, there's been something like that going on in the foreign policy area ever since late last month. The president sort of indicated he was going to yeah. immediately yes. take our troops out of Syria and raise additional questions about how long he'd keep troops in Afghanistan. Um, only about 2,000 troops in, um, in, in Syria, but uh, first he was going to take them out. Then his foreign policy people started saying, well, he's going to look at it some more. Now there are new intentions that the Army has announced. They're going to start moving those troops out, taking the first steps toward doing that. Mm -hmm. We don't know the timetable, but it appears to be back on the front burner for something to happen. Is there just a lot of confusion all the way around, both in Washington and overseas with our allies, on what our intentions are? I think there is. I mean, it's partly the nature of decision-making with this presidency. Uh, the decision on Syria evidently came after a phone call with Turkish President Erdogan, uh, in which the president felt reassured, um, talking to Erdogan, that Erdogan and the Turks would take care of the issue of ISIS, and so the United States could get out. What I mean, about the issue of the Kurds? That, well, that seems to be the real sticking that point. That, of course, I mean, being the, a very... The Turks and the, and the, and yeah. the, and the, and the, the Kurds don't get along very well, and if we right. leave, the, the, Kur the Kurds may be in big trouble. Well, that is that, exactly. That's not, of course, something that's high on President Trump's list. That's more something that many of his advisors, particularly uh, Defense Secretary Mattis, who felt, I think, quite strongly about that and was one of the reasons for his resignation. But now that he's out, there's not that resistance, and so, uh, in a way, Bolton, um, who was both for it, now against it, now seems to, to have, have tried to, to, to uh, do some damage control on it um, has played a role in this, but it, it, it does strike me that you have the conflict between President Trump's foreign policy promises and uh, 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 America first foreign policy and what is the American foreign policy establishment's uh, general desire to work with allies and not uh, change policy dramatically. The President talks a lot about America first in terms of his foreign policy, but it appears to be in actuality be implemented by both impulse and by tweet. How, right. how does that work as compared to what we've seen in previous previous administrations, we, we don't always seem very well coordinated in whatever we're trying to do. Well, it would be, uh, although President Trump is always sort of different from many of his predecessors, it would be wrong for me to say that there hasn't been confusion and uh, bureaucratic battles in the past. In fact, American foreign policy has often been plagued by divisions between State Department, Defense Department, National Security Advisor, uh, and presidential ideas. But not usually played out at this level. Not, in, usually, in the media played, and and not usually played out in public. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, the, what's, what's norm-defying here is, of course, the use of Twitter, um, the, the degree to which the president
president um, does publicly say things before, or, or the, the degree to which his advisors are often blindsided by his decisions. Secretary of State Pompeo has been sent over to the Middle East. He's doing sort of an explanation tour across mm -hmm. there. He also used that opportunity to go to Cairo to make a speech to sort of restate what American foreign policy is going to be in the Middle East. That's also where President Obama made a speech about the yes. Middle East uh, several yeah. years ago. It appears that, President, that Mr. Pompeo spent most of his time blaming the previous administration, although not by name, for their mistakes. Was this sort of a way of changing the subject? It might have been. It's also, uh, it, it's also uh, he ch clearly chose that with symbolism in mind. The Obama uh, Cairo speech was a, uh, a sore point for many Republicans because, in effect, President Obama was blaming, to some extent, George W. Bush for some of the problems that had come up in the Middle East, 9-11, um, Guantanamo, and things like that, that Obama was determined to change. And so th this is a bit of payback on that, uh, the idea of uh, now blaming Obama for uh, some of these problems. It also was a way to reach out um, not to the populations of the Middle East, but to their leaders. Namely, it's reassuring autocrats like Al Sisi in Egypt and Erdogan in Turkey and others that the United States is going to follow a rather different policy on uh, many issues in the Middle East. In professor the Thomas Swartz, our guest from Vanderbilt University, he's a presidential scholar, also a, pre a professor of both of political science and history. Back to continue our conversation with the professor after this break.